Good. All right. So this is new. Discovered today. Don't leave my laptop. That's nice. Pretty soon I'll just be able to walk in here. Sans everything. What's up? Yeah, how did you do that? Magic. It's called the internet. See? Look at that. The internet at work. You too can view these slides. Stop it. No, no one would do that. Uh, I don't know what's going on down here, though. Don't blame me. I can't figure out why that won't go away. That's some bug with, with Firefox. Why is there Firefox installed? Anyway, I feel like I'm in the past. Um, all right, so uh, today we're going to talk about virtualization. I lied on Friday. I don't do that often. Uh, but I thought we'd talk about virtualization first. Um, as I've uh, pointed out on discourse, the rest of the class is sort of a, a grab bag. So we'll do, we definitely want to talk about virtualization because virtualization is really interesting. Um, there's some fun systems aspects. It's everywhere. It's certainly a part of the modern computing environment. You guys are using it if you're using our Vagrant virtual machine. Um, uh, so Simon 3's do second part is due Friday. Um, Scott should have the targets up today so you can start submitting. Um, certainly today or tomorrow. Um, and yeah, so we're going to do virtualization first, and then on the discourse forum, please feel free. If there's, if there's things you want to talk about, if you want to talk about hyper-threading, if you want to talk about whatever, um, you know, feel free to add those, and we'll, we'll try to slate those. I realize not the last week, because the last Wednesday of class, we will not have class. You guys can go see um, this, this visitor from Microsoft Research. On Monday, so Monday and Friday, the Friday before, are probably the classes that are up in the air at this point as far as topical material. So if you would like me to cover something, whatever it is, data center computing, I mean, it has to be systems related. I don't want to do too much networking stuff. We have a class about that. Um, so I don't want to steal Demetrios' thunder. But um, if you want to talk about something related to systems, propose it, and we'll think about it. All right, and then uh, finally, please look at, uh, on Wednesday, we're going to do a so today we're going to talk about one approach to virtualization. On Wednesday, we're going to talk about a different approach to virtualization. This is another um, kind of very widely used technology that actually sprang from the head of a research paper. Um, so we'll read that paper on and discuss it on Wednesday. So please read Zen and the Art of Virtualization. Again, this is probably one of those just a, the top tier in terms of papers that were influential and created sort of an entire industry, certainly created an entire approach to approaching virtualization. All right, any questions about material we covered last week? Any questions about RAID, lingering doubts? So the material, all the material that we present and we cover in class, including the papers, is fair game for the final exam. Now, I'm not going to ask weird arcane details about the papers or the systems that we didn't discuss in class, so don't worry about that. Um, but, you know, when you're reviewing for the exam, you can look at the slides, but please, you know, refer to the papers as needed. Okay. So who thinks they understand virtualization? Who uses virtualization on a regular basis? Okay. Is that, how, okay, let me just, let's continue to do this participatory exercise. How many people have an EC2 instance that they use? Okay. Like, all your hands should be up. Uh, it's free. You can get like a free micro instance for a year. I know EC2 is kind of scary. Like the interface, it's like flying to 747. And you're, I always feel like if I push the wrong button, I'm going to get a bill next month for like $1,000 or something terrible. But um, it's not that bad. Um, you can certainly sign up, get a free instance, play around with it. It's not super exciting. At the end of all these button pushings and other things, what you have is like a Linux server that doesn't have anything installed on it. But whatever. Um, you know, It's a useful experience to get familiar with some of these tools. So go out and play with that stuff. Um, and how, has anyone used Docker? Okay. Yeah, anyone heard of Docker? Okay. So there's a lot of excitement in this space. Uh, there's a lot of new ideas in this space. We may, I, I might try to add a lecture on, um, on OS virtualization a la Docker if people are interested in that because that's something that's not covered uh, by the current two lectures we do now. So feel free to vote for that. Um, so up until this point in the class, right, at this point we're going to kind of gonna try to change your perspective a little bit. Um, and, and we'll talk exactly about how powerful interfaces can be. So we've been talking about machines running on real physical hardware. We talk about the software hardware boundary. We're talking about hardware, um, actual devices that have run instructions. Um, 
So these are real hardware resources. The operating system has exclusive access to them. So throughout the first couple decades of OS research, this was the assumption. The operating system was the piece of software that would multiplex these resources, uh, build abstractions on top of them, and in general manage all the resources on a specific physical machine. Um, and it does this by using these lower level hardware interfaces directly. Um, now, what's interesting about this, and hopefully what you guys have figured out is you've used tools like, I mean, how many people have used VirtualBox or something? Okay, good. So it, it, there's, there's clearly something interesting going on here because I can set up VirtualBox and I can create this thing called a virtual machine and then inside the virtual machine, I can run an entire operating system like, for example, Windows. Um, and I can run it, and I can, you know, I'm, this is all being done in software, clearly. The performance is not terrible, which is interesting. Um, so how does this work? Um, how is this possible? And this is really the basis, this is the building block for a lot of what you guys are familiar with, is sort of the modern experience of computing. So like most of the websites that you visit, most of the online tools that you use are now, you know, there is no machine um, they're, they're sitting there running that website on bare metal. Instead, what there is is a data center in which the machine that that website is running on is itself an abstraction. It's, it's, it's virtual. This is a new illusion that we're going to create. And that machine is now mixed in maybe on one large machine with like dozens of other machines that are doing other things. In fact, the, the website that is serving these slides is a virtual machine that runs on top of another machine with a bunch of other stuff on. Not a bunch, but a few other things, right? That my lab maintains. So this is useful, this is kind of cool, and this is really how computing works at this point. So at this point we've really um, fundamentally thrown out this relationship between a computer and a physical machine. The idea of a computer is very, very, has become much, much more strongly associated, particularly on servers, with the idea of, of a virtual machine. Um, so let's get some terminology straight when we start talking about this, because now we have a couple of different operating systems that we need to talk about. The operating system that runs, so, so the virtual machine um, is the interface that the thing that runs inside the virtual machine uh, experiences. The piece of software that creates this virtual machine is sometimes known as a VMM, or a virtual machine monitor, okay? Um, inside the virtual machine, we have a guest operating system, um, and the virtual machine, the operating system that runs the virtual machine monitor, we sometimes refer to as a host operating system. So to use the example from your Vagrant VM that you use for the class, in that case, the virtual machine monitor is what? What's a piece of software that provides a virtual machine abstraction in this case? Turns out it's virtual box, right? Don't get confused. Vagrant is kind of just a fancy set of scripts that manipulate virtual box and some other VMs, VMMs, right? It could be VMware, it could be something else. In this case, we use virtual box. Uh, what's the guest operating system? Ubuntu Linux, I think it's 14.04 maybe. And the host operating system is whatever you run on your machine. For me it's Mac, maybe for you it's Windows or something else. It could be Ubuntu. You could be running an Ubuntu virtual machine on Ubuntu. This is not only uh, not weird, but it's actually useful in a lot of cases um, for isolation and other things. Okay, um, now in order to get this right, in order to build a virtual machine, we clearly have to uh, meet some design requirements. So the first thing is, um, and, and let me make one more note, which is that the view that we're talking about today is very, we're very much today talking about sort of commercial user-facing virtualization. When we talk Wednesday or maybe Friday about Zen, that system works quite differently. So what we're talking about today is this idea of virtualization where there is a host operating system, there's some operating system running on the, on the machine, and then there's this app like VirtualBox or VMware that runs another operating system inside of it. Systems like Zen, which we're gonna talk about on Wednesday, are really more built for server virtualization, and in that case, there's really no notion of a, a host operating system. Instead, what I can do is I can take one physical machine, split it up into a bunch of virtual machines, there's a new name for the piece of, small piece of software that manages the physical machine and creates the virtual machine abstraction. That's called a hypervisor, you may have heard that term. 
Um, and, but that's sort of a fundamentally different story. So today we're talking about this idea that I can run an operating system like an app in a window inside some other operating system. Um, so obviously, one thing we need to do, one thing that's really critical here, is we can't let the guest operating system get out of the virtual machine. The guest operating system, we need to make sure that the guest operating system's, the resources that it is managing are the resources that I've created for it that I provided to the virtual machine monitor. If the guest operating system could suddenly take over the entire machine, then this wouldn't be very useful, right? Or very safe. Um, and the way that I have to do this fundamentally is I have to fiddle and manipulate this idea of kernel privilege. So remember when we talked before, we talked about the, the simple view of the world where the kernel has ultimate privilege and ultimate control of the resources on the computer and everything else runs in user space and has a much lower privilege level. We have to somehow figure out how to get the kernel, which is used to having all of this privilege. That's the problem. Kernels are built, when you load Microsoft Windows inside a virtual machine, it assumes it's running the actual machine, like that's what it's gonna try to do. So it's gonna do things like execute privilege instructions and do other stuff that it shouldn't be able to, because if we give it full privilege, now it can take over the entire machine. So we need to figure out how to accomplish this. This is the, this is the design problem. Um, so just to be clear, the virtual machine monitor is a piece of software that runs on the host operating system that can allow another operating system, the guest OS, to be run as an application alongside other applications. This is, you guys, you guys know this, right? You guys have experienced this before. How many people have used like VirtualBox or something else other than this class? Okay. You should, it's super useful, right? Like, oh, you wanna figure out how to set up a piece of software or like a server or something, like set it up inside VirtualBox. That way, if you make a mistake, you can just destroy VirtualBox, start over, right? Frequently, it's a lot easier to iterate inside a virtual machine where you can do things like checkpoints and stuff like that than it is on, on bare metal, where every time, you, you, know, every time you, you mess up on bare metal, you have to start over, reinstall the whole thing, whatever. Uh, that's a huge pain. All right, um, and hopefully this also brings across the point that, remember at the beginning of class, we said the OS is just a program like other programs? Like, this should make this really clear because I can literally run it alongside other programs inside the host operating system. Hello, that's interesting. Oh, it doesn't, <laughs> apparently Firefox doesn't like my jokes, so sorry, they're gone. There was only one of them, I think, today. Um, all right, so why, so let's step, take a step back here. We're gonna talk about how we do this, which is super cool, but why? Like, why? Why would we bother with this? So, you know, we've been talking about operating systems all semester, and hopefully you guys have, you know, been convinced that they're kind of cool and worth studying, and they do some interesting things, and there's some nice design principles at work here, and there's things you can learn from them. Um, but what are some of the problems with OS environments um, that are sort of, now again, you guys live in a virtualized era, so, if you want to think about problems with traditional operating systems, you could also think about things that you would use a virtual machine for. So, what are some of the, why did we all, why did the whole industry move in this direction? Yeah? Um, implementing, well, you can really implement like a thin client on a traditional operating system, you have to add like a disk, a whole physical machine. So, if you want to string an operating system or IP, it's an interesting use case. So, so, yeah, so I mean, the, there, there are some software packages where to experiment with them, like for example, Sys161, right? Uh, to experiment with them, it's actually a lot more effective to, so imagine we wanted to give everybody the opportunity to use this great piece of software called System161, right? Which is awesome and clearly a lot of fun and enjoyable. Um, we could do two things. One is we could figure out how to get it to run on every type of system um, known to man which would take a while, or I can just pack it up in a VM and ship it off to you and then I can rely on the fact that VirtualBox and VMware and other companies that make virtualization software have solved this problem, right? So that's actually um, a, a, a much nicer solution. In this case, what we're talking about is a coupling between um, the operating system and software. So in theory, the OS is supposed to provide an interface that is general enough that any piece of software can use it. In reality, what happens is that in many cases you have tight coupling between the operating system and a piece of software, and it's easier to distribute both of them together. Um, hey, I just said that, that's cool. Um, 
So this is kind of a this is kind of a dumb reason, right? But I mean, clearly, if you want to run four different operating systems, this is what I would tell you to do. Every time someone says the word dual boot, I have these like flashbacks and just say, "Stop! Don't do that! Like, don't ever set up. A, there's no reason to dual boot your computer. Just don't do it. It's dumb. Um, make a decision and then install VirtualBox right away, and then you can install six different operating systems. And if that's what you want to do for some reason. Um, same thing here, right? I mean, you guys have experienced this this year. I mean, when you guys installed our, our virtual machine, you got all of this environment that I set for you. Now, some of you guys didn't like parts of it, sorry. Um, and maybe you changed it yourself or whatever. But this means that I can control everything about the system, right? From the, like the settings for shells and SSH and stuff like that, I can distribute this complete environment uh, that you can use. Docker is probably the best example of people using that today. When you install something using Docker, you, you not only get whatever piece of software it is that you're using, for example, the, the forum that we're using, Discourse, comes on Docker. Not only do you get Discourse, but you get everything that Discourse needs to run. You get the passenger uh, Ruby on Rails, whatever the heck it is. I, I mean, Ruby on Rails scares me. Um, you get, like, the, there's a web server that runs inside of it, whatever. So you bundle up all of the software together and all the configurations that those tools require, and all I have to do is, you know, type one command, and the whole thing just installs. It's pretty cool. Um, this is another, this is probably one of the biggest reasons. So when resource needs change, it's very difficult using bare metal to adjust things on the fly. Um, you know, a particular website, traffic is really high in the morning, plummets in mid-afternoon and then picks up again in the evening. Um, I can, if I put that on its own machine, there's large portions of the day where that machine is underutilized. If I put it on a machine with a bunch of other things that have different usage patterns, I get some statistical multiplexing and now I can run the machine pretty well utilized um, without, you know, uh, by sort of, uh, you know, exploiting the fact that different websites have different activity patterns, right? Um, and, and, you know, these two things sort of go together. With, the, with bare metal, when you install this thing, you better hope that that's the machine you need. Because if it's not, you know, now you've got to reinstall the whole thing again, try to move things around. It's, it's a real pain. I mean, um, virtualized servers can be moved from machine to machine. They can have their, uh, you can, I, you know, essentially if the website's running too slowly on opsclass.org, I can shut it down quickly, boost the memory usage by a couple of gigabytes, reboot it, and I'm done, right? Um, I can do that by clicking things. I don't have to open up a machine, buy memory, stick it in there, hope I don't electrocute myself or uh, cause the machine, give the machine a static that's gonna cause it to fail, whatever. Uh, it's a lot nicer. Um, so here's another, and, and, and to some degree, unfortunately, some of the problems that we're pointing out here are kind of like failures of OS design. Um, so for example, isolation between applications. So operating systems to some degree are supposed to prevent applications from interfering with each other from a fault perspective. So if application A crashes, it shouldn't take the whole machine down with it, nor should anything that application A does allow application B to crash. But if I'm really talking about stricter isolation, what else do I worry about when I have application A and application B running on the same machine? It's not, so we're talking, I mean, let, let's say I can build an operating system, and we, we accomplished this several decades ago, that makes sure that there's nothing application A can do that will cause application B to crash. But how is application B still not isolated from application A? What can application do, A do that might affect application B? Yeah, Steve. Their resources could be shared, and A could make it so B won't stack them up. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, they're, they're accessing, they're, they're competing for shared resources memory, you know, the I.O. controller. So they compete for performance. And so if, if you look at Zen and some of the work on pair virtualization and the whole virtualization movement that took off, part of it was uh, because what would happen is you would buy, like let's say you, would, you buy like a database application, right, from some vendor. And you think, okay, great, I have a high performance database. I'm gonna install it on my big server with my web server and with my email server and with all these other things. And then it turns out, you discover after you read the fine print um, of the contract, that the company guarantees the performance of their database server only if it is the only thing running on the machine. And this is not made up, this, was, uh, this actually happens. 
Um, so now it's like, oops, now I have to go get a whole other machine to run this stupid thing on, and I have all the problems with utilization that we talked about just a minute ago. Um, where, you know, if that thing doesn't, doesn't keep the machine busy enough, then I'm wasting a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of resources. So, um, operating systems also tend to leak a lot of information between processes that can be important for security reasons. Isn't that interesting? Um, you know, this is also kind of terrible. Has anyone ever had to try to set up a piece of software that just refused to install on a machine with another piece of software? Thankfully, that seems to be a solved problem. Uh, in the past, though, it wasn't, right? Like, you started installing something from source, and you realized, oh, no, it requires this library, this other thing has this other library, and then a whole week of your life goes by, right? Um, and that's not a week that you're ever going to remember or look back on fondly. Um, so here's, here's another problem. In certain cases, the performance of an application depends a lot on the ability to tune the underlying operating system to make that application happy. Databases are a famous... Um, our famous culprit here. So a database will say, I will run really, really fast if you set all of these kernel parameters exactly this way. And it turns out that those settings are great for the database and maybe not so great for everybody else. Um, and so this is another case where the coupling between an application and the underlying operating system can cause a lack of isolation between the operating system, between that application and other applications. Because now I've done things to help that application that have hurt other applications. We'll come back and talk about this when we talk about performance next week. Um, yeah, and I just, I just pointed that out. Okay. So I, I think you guys sort of understand these sorts of things, right? I mean, this clearly we did, right? You know that this is possible, um, and it's super useful. Um, the, this is also very possible. I can take, you know, Google can take their data center, they can build it out with a large number of really homogenous machines, and then they can divide those machines up in a variety of different ways as needed by various applications. A certain application doesn't need a lot of memory, fine, don't give it a lot of memory. Another application doesn't need a disk, great, don't give it a disk. I can build, so if you imagine I have, start with a big machine with like 64 cores and 64 gigabytes of RAM and a bunch of disks that I can configure in various ways, I can use that machine to create a lot of configurations that are appropriate for the virtual machines that are running inside of it. Right? It gives me a huge amount of flexibility. Um, and of course I can do things like migration. So when things fail or if I need to take a few machines down to do something, or as load changes, I find out that two VMs that used to work well on one machine now are conflicting with each other because of usage patterns, move it. it just, it's not that hard. I mean, yes, I have to transfer a fairly big chunk of stuff around, but it's nothing compared to the work required to move migrate configurations that run on bare metal. Is that a question or just a, a place to put your hand? Okay, cool. Um, all right, so. What do I actually, what, is the, what does the VM actually have to accomplish? This is interesting, right? What, what do I, are the, well, these are sort of the design requirements for the virtual machine monitor. And I, I was very surprised to find out that these were formalized very, very early. So, you know, it's not clear that in 1974 uh, these guys ever thought that this stuff would be useful, but it, it kind of is. Um, so here are, are three essential requirements. The first thing is that on the virtual machine, Software should execute roughly the same way. This is called fidelity. Um, now, obviously, when I'm actually sharing resources between multiple virtual machines, there might be some timing differences and other things, but it shouldn't affect correctness. If I run the program, it should get the same result, or it should be able to do the same things. Um, the second one, which is sort of at odds with the first one, is performance. If, so, does anyone, I mean, well, we're talking about virtual machines, um, what is a simulator? How is a simulator different than a virtual machine? Does anyone know? Maybe we'll come back to this in a minute. So one of the requirements for virtual machines is that they be able to run very fast, pretty much at the same speed as the underlying hardware. Simulators do not do this, and, and I'll come back and we'll talk about that. Remind me if there's not a slide about it. I think there is. Um, the final thing is that the virtual machine monitor should manage all hardware resources so that the guest operating system cannot get out. If I, give, if I do not provide the application, the virtual machine monitor, with a certain piece of memory, there should be no way for anything that runs inside that virtual machine to access that memory. Okay? This is pretty important. 
Um, particularly if you think now about all these multi-tenant environments like Amazon and Google and things like that. I mean, Amazon's running uh, virtual machines provided by probably tens if not hundreds of thousands of different companies. So if I couldn't keep resources from one of them safe from another, I might have a problem. I might be leaking sort of secrets from one, uh, from one server to another, virtual server. Okay, so there, there are, now there are two, you can define approaches to uh, virtualization into two categories. The one we're gonna talk about today is what's called full virtualization. And in, in full virtualization, I wanna be able to run, the goal here is to be able to run an unmodified guest operating system inside the virtual machine. That's the design goal. On Wednesday, we'll talk about, sorry, I'm gonna read this paper for Wednesday. Uh, on Wednesday, we'll talk about pair virtualization. So pair virtualization is, is a little different. Pair virtualization says, you know what? I'm willing to trade a small number of changes to the operating system. And of course, one of the things that's critical about pair virtualization is that is small in order for much better performance and a much simpler system. It's a much simpler virtual machine monitor. Uh, because it turns out that one is hard, or the first bullet is tough to do. So people did that, and there were companies that were built around doing it, and then later on, a little bit later on, somebody said, wait, hold on. We could do either do all this work to run unmodified Linux, or we can make a small number of changes to Linux that allows it to cooperate with the virtual machine monitor, and then the performance would be a lot better, and it'd be a lot simpler. And, that, and so these are two different approaches. Um, but today, let's talk about full virtualization. So the goal here is to be able to run this unmodified operating system inside the virtual machine. Um, so VMware is probably, I mean, I don't know if this is true anymore. Maybe VirtualBox has surpassed them, right? But VMware was really the leader in this area for a long time. They developed a lot of these solutions. Um, I don't know if they were first or not, but I mean, they were certainly among the first to be able to do this effectively. Um, and now there are, uh, free solutions. So what's hard about this? So I'm trying to run an unmodified operating system in a virtual machine. Why is this difficult? Steve, you have an idea? The guest OS wants full privileges and it doesn't recognize the VM as software. Yeah, I mean, it, it wants or expects, you know? The operating system is like, you know, like, it, it, it just expects things to be a certain way, you know? It's like some rock star that shows up and says, you know, I said no blue M&Ms, right? I just don't want any blue M&Ms in my bowls of M&Ms, that's not okay. Um, you know, they just expect it to be that way. So, you know, how, how and, and the thing is, because they expect it to be that way, they're gonna, they're gonna run those instructions, a true story. Um, so, and, and what's gonna happen when, so what happens when, I just gave the answer away, but I'll take it off. What happens when the, op, what's gonna start happening when the operating system, the guest operating system starts to run? So remember, I'm not, I can't run it with full kernel privilege. Why not? Why not just run the guest with, with kernel privilege? Not a problem. What could it do? Yeah. Anything it wants, Anything it wants right? Including get out of the virtual machine. So, so remember, the virtual machine is an application. That application has access to some memory on the machine. If I allow the guest operating system kernel privilege, it can just change the TLB entries itself and see any page on the system. Bad, cannot, cannot do that, okay? So I'm running it without kernel privilege. What's gonna happen almost immediately? The guest, the, the, the guest operating system starts to run. And before long, it's gonna do what? It's gonna trap, why? Yeah, it's going to run, an, an, a, it's going to execute an instruction that requires kernel privilege. Let's like, so let's use the example of modifying the TLB, which is not an x86 instruction, but whatever. So let's say it does something like that. It's not running with kernel privilege. So what would I do to a normal application that did this? Let's say like Skype tried to modify the TLB. What would I do? Boom. You know, the, you cannot, like, that's an exception. The real kernel who's actually in charge of 
the system's going to run, it's going to say that was bad. Uh, you weren't supposed to do that. And it's going to terminate the process. So this is what would normally happen. Um, yes, and, and the guest OX is, is going to tr try to a execute these privilege instructions, right? What, so, so here's another question. What about a process running inside the guest operating system? What's complicated about that? So let's say the process, let's say a process, what, what sort of complications arise? Now, now the process that runs, runs inside the guest operating system, this is important. That process is used to running in an unprivileged way. So if it, you know, it's not going to have this problem where it's going to try to execute privileged instructions. What is it going to do? Invariably. Yeah, it's going to like do a system call, okay? Now, who's going to handle, like, who would normally handle that system call? The host operating system. So, who should handle that system call? The guest operating system, right? If, you know, the calling conventions are totally different. If a Linux program, until I guess very recently, if a Linux program tries to run on a Windows system, and, and it, it, it just won't work, right? I mean, the, call, the way that you trap into the kernel and the, where you put the arguments are different enough, I think, I assume, between these systems that it, it's just the window, if you try to make a Linux-like system call on a Windows system, it's just be like, I have no idea what that is, or those arguments are garbage, or whatever, right? Um, so I need to make sure, so there's really two couple of challenges here. What to do about the guest operating system is going to try to execute privileged instructions, and how to make sure that traps and system calls generated by the uh, processes running in the guest operating system get to the right place. Because normally they would go to the host OS, and they actually need to go to the guest OS. Um, all right, so we just pointed this out. Uh, we can't do that. We can't run it with, with uh, kernel privilege. It would see the entire machine. If I run it with user privilege, it's going to have to figure out how to do uh, run uh, privilege instructions. Okay, um, so so here's what would happen ideally. Um, ideally, when the deprivileged operating system, so remember, it's just a program. A lot of what the OS does is not privileged. So a lot of the math the operating system is doing, a lot of the instructions that an operating system will execute are not privileged. So that's good. That means that I don't have very many special cases to handle. When it executes a privileged instruction, here's what should happen. Here's what we want to happen. The CPU is supposed to trap this. It's supposed to say, you cannot execute this instruction. You don't have the required privilege. This requires kernel privilege, and you're a user program. I know you don't like that. Too bad. OK? So uh, CPU traps. Now here's the thing. Here's where this gets interesting. This trap has to make its way to the virtual machine monitor. When you guys install VirtualBox, do you remember something interesting about it? Why is it a little different than other applications to install? Same thing with VMware. You just double click it and it just runs, no problem, right? What does this require? Yeah. It installs some kernel drivers, yeah. That is required for this to happen. Because normally what happens here is the guest operating system runs, sorry, the host operating system runs and kills the VMM. So I need cooperation from the host operating system to get this to work. The host operating system has to realize, hmm, OK, there's this one special app where when it has one of these privilege violations, before I kill it, I actually hand it to the VMM and I say, it's possible that this is due to something that the guest operating system inside you is trying to run. See if you can handle it for me. If not, it's, it's possible that like the VMM is buggy, right? So it's possible that this is this will be still a problem. But you need cooperation from the host operating system to get this to work. That's that's important to understand. Um, so now this ends up in the VMM. Now most of the what are most of the privileged instructions that the VMM might try to run? Like again, take the example of a TLB. Uh, an, an, an operation that's trying to modify the TLB. What is that doing? Like, these can be, a, a lot of these involve doing what? Yeah, modifying some special piece of hardware that the virtual machine, that the, the operating system controls. 
In this case, that hardware is to some degree abstracted by the VMM. So the VMM has to look at this and say, okay, well, yes, this particular modification to the DLB is okay and allow it, right? So the VMM has to see these exceptions. If this can happen, we refer to this instruction, this is an instruction that's called classically virtualizable. The approach here is called trap and emulate. So I trap the privileged instruction and the VMM emulates what would happen if that instruction was actually executed on real hardware. There are a gazillion details that I'm glossing over here, but this is the overall approach. This is particularly, if you really want to try to blow your own mind, try to understand uh, x86 um, shadow page tables. Those are, those are wild. Um, anyway, so x86 makes this even more complicated because it has a hardware managed TLB, so the TLB faults are not generated, the hardware handles them automatically. So anyway, Google shadow page tables and then I'll come back a week later and we'll talk about it. Uh, but it's very cool. If you can understand shadow page tables, like A plus. Um, all right, this is trap and emulate. Uh, so if the, so what does the VMM do with traps that occur within the virtual machine? Um, if the trap is caused by an application, so remember, both categories of traps, both system calls and exceptions, virtual memory related exceptions, they're all going to jump out of the VM, VMM, have to be handled by the host operating system and passed back in. Once they get to the virtual machine monitor, I have a couple of choices about what to do. If, it, if, I, if the virtual machine was running in kernel mode, then this is something that I may need to handle directly. If it's a user system call, then actually what I'm going to do is hand it back into the kernel. So, the, so what would happen here, do I have a, uh, a I guess I, I'm not sure I have a slide about this. So a system call in the underlying operating, by a, a, an application running in the guest operating system will first cause the host operating system to run, then the VMM will run, then the kernel will run, the guest operating system will run, and then maybe again later the application will run. So you can see some of the performance overhead um, caused by this approach. It's sort of inherent. There's a lot more people involved, there's a lot more actors involved when I do something like make a system call. All right. Um, so, yeah, so I just pointed this out, you know, um, you need support from the host operating system here. Otherwise, it would just think that uh, VirtualBox was a buggy application and kill it immediately. Yeah? Uh, what makes every pair of host and guest operating systems compatible with each other? Like, what, what guarantees that these traps will So, so the, the piece of software you run as a virtual machine monitor has to install some sort of driver on the host operating system. So those drivers are yeah, absolutely. Yep, those drivers would be specific to your host operating system, right? So Windows, you install a particular set of drivers that cause things to get handed back to VirtualBox. Linux it would be a totally different set of drivers. Right? Good, good question. Uh, same thing with Mac, right? So that, that's kind of what binds the two together. There's also something, I mean, you guys may have noticed this, there's something you can install inside the guest operating system to improve performance. I'm not exactly sure how that works, but I would be happy to look into it if you guys are curious. Um, all right. Now here's, the, now here's the nice thing about this, right? We, there is an overhead associated with exceptions and traps, whether they're generated by the guest operating system or applications that are running inside the virtual machine. However, most of the time, the guest operating system and guest applications use the processor and the rest of the system normally. That's critical. Um, how, so, so this creates a require. This creates a compatibility requirement. So I'll come back to your question, right? Um, so, what does this require? If if a guest operating system and the guest applications are going to use the processor normally most of the time, there's one additional requirement here that we haven't talked about that I need to satisfy to make this work. Could I run an operating system compiled for ARM inside an x86? on an x86 host operating system, on an x86 hardware machine? No. So the hardware interface has to be compatible. 
So that's pretty important. So if you tried to take like an, a native Android app and run it on an x80, inside an x86 virtual machine, not going to work. Because most of the time, it's just executing native instructions. And if the native instructions and in sets are different, I'm in trouble. If they're the same, I'm good. OK, uh, I think we just talked about this. So when a guest operates something running inside, the, the, when a guest application makes a system call, um, the host OS vectors the trap to the VMM, VMM inspects it, um, then it traps back into the VMM uh, when the host, when the guest operating system is finished running, um, and the VMM passes the arguments back to the process initially the system call. So there are several additional steps that make this higher overhead. Um, so what, what about a, what happens, let's say I generate like a TLB or a memory related fault the guest operating system. So let's walk through this. What happens? What's the first thing that happens? Trapping, Trapping what? Uh, uh, mm. Somebody want to make a different answer? So I'm not running. The, I'm not running with privilege. So this will generate an exception. Who handles the exception first? The guest OS? Would that be safe? The VMM. Eh, not the VMM either. Where does the exception go? Host operating system. All right, so I trap into the host OS. Then I hand that trap over to the VM. The host OS sees, OK, this is a, this is a trap that, that's by an application that's allowed to handle these itself. So I have to hand it to the VMM. Now the VMM is going to inspect the trap C was generated by the application and then pass control to the guest operating system, right? So now the guest operating system has to handle this TLB fault. Sorry, I think I confused myself at the beginning of this. This is a TLB exception caused by an application running inside the guest. So this is a guest application. So now the guest operating system has to run. The guest operating system is going to try to handle the TLB fault. What is it going to do? Inevitably. I mean, the result of this is, as you guys are finding out for assignment three, what do I have to do? I mean, a bunch of this is just manipulating my own data structures, whatever, but at the end of the day, in order to allow this translation to succeed, what does the guest operating system have to do? Right to the TLB, which is going to do what? Generate another exception back to the host operating system, because I've I, now I've executed a privileged instruction when running in user mode. Um, then I hand that trap back to the VMM, see that it was handled by the guest OS, and then the, guest, and then the VMM will adjust the state of the virtual machine appropriately. Does this make sense? Understanding how these chains of things happen is, is pretty critical. All right. Um, so so w what I want to point out here you know, before we close for today is what I'm virtualizing here is actually the the hardware ABI or the hardware interface, which is really interesting. Um, I'm, you know, if you compare this to virtual memory, right? So for virtual memory, the interface was load and store, and all I had to do was make sure that those uh, instructions executed the way that I thought they should. Right? When I load, I get the value that I last stored. When I store, I can set a new value. Um, for for virtual memory. I ensured safety by translating every access, and I got good performance by caching translations. The approach with, uh, with virtualized hardware is different. In this case, the interface is the full hardware instruction set. From the perspective of things that run inside the virtual machine, I just need to make sure that that instruction set behaves the same way with, the, with regard to the state of the virtual machine that's represented by the virtual machine monitor. So for example, if my virtual machine is only configured to have 512 megabytes of memory, it should only be able to access 512 megabytes of memory, even if it's running on a machine that has eight you know, gigabytes of memory. Right? Um, and in this case, what we do in, to ensure safety is when I see these privileged instructions, I have to intercept them and make sure that they don't pierce the virtual machine. So these privileged instructions have the potential to alter the underlying hardware state in a way that would allow the guest operating system to get out. And I need to make sure that this doesn't happen. Um, how do I get, what, what, uh, what 
the performance, bleh, sputtery, uh, the performance of virtual machine depends on what to some degree. How do I get good performance out of this? Remember, this is one of my requirements of, of a piece of software to be a virtual machine. How do I get good performance? Yeah. Fidelity. Yeah, fidelity comes along with this, right? But, you know, what the performance of this is dependent on what? Yeah. So, okay, so that's always going to be slow, right? Anything, any privileged instructions, any traps have this much longer path that they're going to have to follow. However, performance is not that bad because of what? Uh, you initialize it with a lot of access to your CPU and memory. Yeah, we're getting closer, yeah. Most instructions execute natively. Yeah, so safe instructions. Like if you compute pi inside a virtual machine, it's going to like run pretty much close to full speed. I mean, it competes with the, anything else running on inside on your sort of host system for resources. But as long as you're just doing math, like there's nothing unsafe about adding two numbers and storing the result in a register. Who cares? That's not going to pierce the VM. So the more instructions I can, of the hardware instructions that I can run, on the underlying hardware safely, the better. And it turns out in most cases, you know, that's, that's quite a few. Um, this will also explain why different pieces of software perform differently inside the virtual machine. Um, things that mainly are dependent on memory and CPU tend to run pretty well, because once they get a hold of the memory they need, they're executing a lot of instructions that don't require any participation by the host operating system or by the virtual machine monitor. Applications that do a lot of I.O., um, you know, that generate a lot of uh, faults tend to run more slowly because I.O. is another uh, place where uh, I have to do a lot of checking to make sure that things are safe, right? Um, to some degree, I'm sort of letting you communicate with this virtual disk, but I need to make sure that communication is, is, is safe. All right. Um, now here's, <laughs> you, may, you may wonder, this, this seems like straightforward. Why was there this huge company and like decades worth of work into getting this to work? Um, so it turns out that whenever, and who knows if they were cognizant of this or not, um, when people design the x86, uh, it is not classically virtualizable, okay? So remember, what, what did that mean? What was required for uh, an architecture to be classically virtualizable? What, when I try to execute a privileged instruction and I'm not in privileged mode, what needs to happen? Yeah. The processor has to generate an exception. That's the only way that I get control, that I can then vector back into the virtual machine monitor. So unfortunately, x86 has a variety of problems. Um, some instructions just don't trap correctly. Um, they just fail silently. So. There's some instruction that if I run it with privilege mode, it does the thing it's supposed to do. And if I run it without privilege mode, it doesn't do that thing. So this is a problem. It means I never get control so that I can make it look like that thing happened. Um, this is even nastier, right? So, so some of the instructions would do one thing when you ran them in privilege mode and another thing when you ran them in non-privilege mode. And neither one of those things was trap. Um, so this is sort of what gave birth to some of the um, interesting work that VMware did early on, where, so now I can't apply this beautiful approach that we just discussed of trap and emulate because not every, that, that will not work on the x86. It breaks in a bunch of different places. So what VMware does, was very clever, is they take portions of the binary of the kernel and the applications as they are running. And you can think of them as taking them and translating them so that the right ex instructions execute. So in cases where I run into these sorts of problems, they rewrite the binary in order to eliminate any instructions that have these sorts of issues, right? And that is just as complicated as it sounds. Um, so yeah, and, and then I have to worry about performance, and so they do fun things where they cache, like once I've translated a particular part of the program, I cache that translation with. Right. Um, all right, so I think I'm done for today. Just let me point out a few things that we didn't talk about. Privilege rings, which we'll come back to on Wednesday, which is kind of cool. Uh, shadow page tables, which I would encourage you guys to explore. Uh, memory traces. 
Um, now, we, we will talk a little bit about this on Wednesday, but what's one of the interesting pieces of software hardware co-evolution that's been happening is that architectures, including ARM and x86, the, the hardware guys have sort of woken up and been like, oh, by the way, there's this virtualization thing going on that people are spending billions of dollars on. Maybe we should help. And so there's a lot of extensions now to newer processors that, that provide this better support. Um, if you're interested in this, you know, go start Googling. There's a lot of cool stuff. On Wednesday, we will talk about Zen and a very different approach to virtualization. Please look at the paper for me. Thank you. See you guys then.